Uh, welcome to the US Asia Law Institute's weekly Asia Law Speaker Program. I'm Catherine Wilhelm, Executive Director of the Institute, and our topic today is extremely timely, uh, One China and Taiwan's Future. Uh, a, a brief announcement first about next Wednesday's talk. The topic will be Construction of Guilt in China with Dr. Grace Mo, who is uh, talking about her book of that title. And the subtitle is An Empirical Account of Routine Chinese Injustice, which gives you uh, the flavor that it is based on fascinating observation and interview data that she collected um, over a number of years. So today we have two speakers, both of whom the uh, US Asia Law Institute can proudly say are Institute insiders. Uh, we'll be discussing the complex and increasingly important question of Taiwan's identity and the tension between the wishes of the majority of Taiwan's people uh, and Beijing's wishes uh, for Taiwan to accept the so-called One China principle and uh, get onto a glide path to reunification. So this is both a legal and a political question and it increasingly has implications beyond Taiwan. Our speakers are Jerry Cohen and Yu Jie Chen. Uh, Jerry Cohen is the founder and director emeritus of the US Asia Law Institute and professor emeritus at NYU School of Law. He is considered a founder of the field of Chinese legal studies at American law schools, uh, having introduced the teaching of Chinese law into the curriculum at Harvard Law School in the 1960s. He has officially retired, uh, but, uh, or so he says, but he's just as busy as ever writing and leading programs here and at the Council on Foreign Relations. And of course, writing uh, quite a bit about Taiwan and the remarkable journey it has made from single party authoritarianism to democracy. Uh, Yu Jie Chun is an assistant research professor at the Law Institute of Taiwan's Academia Sinica and an affiliated scholar at our institute. She received her JSD and LLM degrees from NYU School of Law and was a research scholar with us. She currently researches and writes about human rights and international law and relations, particularly in the context of China, Taiwan and cross-strait relations. Uh, thank you very much um, for making this program uh, possible and thanks for all the help along the way. Um, I thought I would uh, begin today's session by uh, discussing some of the important concepts and uh, maybe misunderstandings and also disputes uh, between China and Taiwan about uh, one China notions. Uh, so once I lay out the uh, foundation, then we can uh, get into the Q&A and we have uh, Jerry here uh, to guide us throughout the discussion. So I'm gonna use my PowerPoint now. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. So, um, I know it can be really confusing to a lot of people about one China conceptions because there are so many formulations out there, but it's really the most important question, the enduring question that haunts cross-strait relations. Um, and there being different uh, one China formulations, which generate uh, a lot of disputes uh, about each other's understanding of this concept one China. So uh, I think all of us are very familiar with Beijing's one China principle, uh, which is that there's only one China in the world, that Taiwan is part of China and that the People's Republic of China represents is the le uh, legitimate uh, government that represents uh, the whole of China. Then we have the US one China policy, which is different from uh, Beijing's one China principle. Um, and then we have Taiwan's KNT's one China respective uh, interpretations. And then we have what we've, uh, uh, often heard these days, the 1992 consensus. So um, why are there so many formulations? 
That's exactly because uh, China and Taiwan, and including Taiwan society and uh, political parties, cannot really reach a one China sort of understanding or agreement uh, with Beijing. So we still have this question uh, that uh, determines either peace or tension across the Taiwan Strait. So I'm going to, in the next um, 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the notions of one China and what I would call no to one China position. And I'm going to slightly uh, touch upon the legal framings of these concepts in Taiwan's uh, legal system, as well as in the PRC's legal system. Uh, but mostly I will focus on the political framings of one China and no to one China. So spoiler alert, here is uh, the conclusion. There's actually no consensus over one China. Uh, what we found, Jerry and I uh, have written an article and it was published in 2009 uh, in the University of Pennsylvania in Asian Law. In that article, we uh, el elaborate uh, why there's really no consensus and it's actually a dissensus over what one China means uh, between China and Taiwan. Um, and I'll talk about that later. So first of all, let me, since we're at the law school, I wanna give you a big picture of the legal framings first. And uh, let's look at the PRC's constitution. Uh, the preamble is an embodiment of uh, Beijing's one China principle. I'm not gonna read it. Uh, you can all see the words uh, on the slide. I want to point out that uh, in the 1982 PRC's constitution, uh, it sets up the special administrative region SAR system, uh, preparing for one country, two systems, which is has been applied uh, in Hong Kong and Macau and was uh, set up to apply to Taiwan. Um, we also see the PRC in 2005 enacted an anti-secession law that uh, uh, legitimizes the use of force uh, by Beijing on Taiwan under certain circumstances, uh, vaguely worded, including when all uh, possibilities of peaceful unification are completely exhausted. Uh, so that's, sort of the legal big picture on the PRC side. And we have, uh, we now look at turn to the uh, ROC constitution. And uh, many would say that uh, the ROC constitution is a one China constitution. And I would like to um, raise some questions uh, for that proposition. I don't think it, it, it is necessarily a one China constitution. Indeed, there are elements of one China in the cons ROC constitution, um, but there are also plenty of room for different interpretations, which I will talk about. But so let's first uh, look at these elements of one China in uh, the ROC constitution. So it still deems the Chinese mainland part as the ROC's territories. Um, and the most important of all, I think it's really important to remember this, uh, while the PRC's constitution has been uh, consistent with regard to the Taiwan question over the years, um, despite the 2005 anti-secession law, with slightly different wording. Um, on the other hand, Taiwan's constitution, the ROC constitution has undergone significant changes uh, since the 1990s with democratization. Uh, so in 1991, the additional articles to the constitution, uh, which was a major amendment uh, reflected that the ROC government only effectively controlled the free area of the ROC, that is Taiwan, Penghu, uh, Kumoi, and Mazu, not the mainland area. 
The preamble of the additional articles also states that uh, to meet the needs of the na nation prior to national unification, um, the following articles of the constitutions are added. So with this wording of national unification, it suggests that the relationship between the free area and the mainland area is one of a divided nation. So one would argue based on the above um, discussion that the ROC constitution is a one China constitution. On the other hand, as I previously said, um, the ROC constitution, I think is uh, ambiguous enough to allow different interpretations. So despite the stated goal of unification, the additional articles of uh, the constitution demand no timetable for achieving the goal of national unification. So this has been interpreted by many in Taiwan to mean that Taiwan can continue to maintain the status quo, i.e de facto independence. And this is not my original argument. This actually has been written by uh, scholars in Taiwan, including the current Chief Justice Xu Zhongli. So the legal framings later became political discourse. Um, in the mid 90s, uh, the then President uh, Li Denhui uh, use the word, the terminology ROC on Taiwan as a new term to imply that the ROC was associated, was associated with Taiwan and with Taiwan only. Uh, this new terminology also reflected that Taiwan people and uh, Taiwan people only elected the government of the ROC, not the, mainland, not the people on mainland China. Later, we have more controversial terminologies. Uh, Li Denhui's famous special state-to-state -state relations formulation, as well as uh, Chen Shui-bian's one country on each side. Uh, these uh, formulations uh, have been controversial because they suggest that a position that says no to uh, one China. So I want to uh, now focus on political framings, especially uh, through the prism of the recent cooperation period from 2008 to 2016, as well as today's political stalemate since 2016. So um, according to the KMT and the CCP, the, the, the Kuomintang and the Chinese Communist Party, they like to say that uh, the cooperation uh, between uh, 2008 and 2016 was built on the 1992 consensus. And here I put a question mark because as I said previously, uh, we found that it wasn't really a consensus, but I think it was a diplomatic maneuver for both parties uh, to set aside their differences. So that was a clever maneuver, uh, but there was not a consensus because when the KMT talks, talks about the 1992 consensus, what it means is one China respective interpretations. So here I put it on the slide. You can see that in KMT's interpretation, China here means uh, means the Republic of China. But on the other hand, the KMT also acknowledges the Chinese uh, Communist Party has a different interpretation of China, which is of course the P PRC. On the other hand, the Chinese uh, Communist Party doesn't really acknowledge the part respective interpretations in in uh, OCRI. So with these very two different understandings, the supposedly consensus is a dissensus over what one China means. 
But why was the dispensers working? It's because it at that time provided a convenient veneer of consensus because neither the KMT nor the CCP were willing to publicly confront the other, thus enabling them to move on to negotiate more immediate issues. And this is pragmat uh, pragmatism. This actual, uh, the actual consensus, if one were pressed to find any sort of mutual understanding or consensus, in this cooperation, I think it would, I would have to say it's the political will shared by the, the Chinese government and the then Taiwan government to avoid one China controversies and to adopt a more pragmatic approach for cooperation. Then now we are, we have a DPP president, Tsai Ing-wen. What's DPP's position on One China? The, P, the DPP um, doesn't recognize the existence of the 1992 consensus whatsoever. The Democratic, uh, the, the Democratic Progressive Party's 1999 resolution on Taiwan's future uh, has already stated that Taiwan is a democratic independent country under the name of the Republic of China, and that any change in Taiwan's independent status quo must be decided by all the residents of Taiwan by means of referendum. And that is the DPP's uh, official position. Despite this official position of the DPP, Tsai Ing-wen, when she was elected uh, for the first term as president in 2016, she did try to uh, reach a middle ground between Beijing's and DPP stances. She, uh, in her inaugural speech, acknowledged the 1992 consensus as a historic fact. She also, emphasized that the 1992 meeting was conducted in a spirit of mutual uh, uh, understanding and a political attitude of seeking common ground while setting aside differences. And I think she really got it right here. This is a buzzword that Beijing and um, Taipei like to use, uh, especially uh, during the KMT and CCP cooperation, seeking common ground while setting aside differences. And that was the understanding behind the 1992 meeting. Uh, but Beijing's reaction was uh, that Tsai ing uh, expression was an incomplete test answer. And since then, uh, Beijing has unilaterally uh, suspended some of the cross-strait agreements uh, that uh, were signed uh, when Ma Injo was president. And um, all official and semi-official contacts have also been uh, diminished. So I'd like to give you a summary of what each party's positions are on uh, these major questions, including One China, Taiwan sovereignty, and uh, China's international representation. On the CCP column, you can see that this is the formula of the One China principle. As I said earlier, there's only one China in the world, um, and that Taiwan is part of China. And China here means the PRC from Beijing's view. And then the PRC is the legitimate exclusive representative, uh, representative of China. So this is the three part of Beijing's one China principle. And I use this to compare uh, the KMT's and the Duke PP's positions as well. So on the first uh, subpart question, the KMT agrees that there's only one China in the world. So they, uh, the CCP and the KMT agree on this point. But on the second question, the KMT 
uh, states that the, its position is that Taiwan is part of China, which is the ROC. And it also allows a different interpretation by Beijing. Um, and as I said before, from Beijing's point of view, that is the PRC, the China is the PRC. And when it comes to China's representation, um, the KMT's position is one China respective interpretations. Um, now let's look at the third column here, uh, the DPP's position. Uh, here, uh, it's uh, very clear that the DPP doesn't uh, acknowledge any one China notions. So its position is that Taiwan should renounce the claim of one China. On the second question of sovereignty, uh, the position is Taiwan is already an independent sovereign state under the name of the Republic of China. And on the third question is that Taiwan should not seek to represent China. Here, the second table shows uh, different par uh, the parties, different positions on different political formulas. And here on the 1992 consensus, you can see that the CCP uh, insists on its one China principle, uh, but it doesn't acknowledge that Taiwan has a different interpretation. And the KMT uh, is as stated, one China respective interpretations. And the DPP says there's no consensus uh, whatsoever. And then Taiwan should build its own Taiwan consensus. Um, on the question of one country, two systems, I don't know if uh, you recall uh, in 2019, just two years ago, uh, during the new year, uh, when Xi Jinping uh, marked the 40th anniversary of the 1979 uh, message to the Taiwan compatriot, uh, Xi, Xi Jinping stated that the best approach to achieving unification of Taiwan is one country, two systems. And um, the Chinese is equal liang zhi, Taiwan fang an, so it's one country, two systems, on Taiwan, and he associated the 1992 consensus with one China, uh, with one country, two systems in that speech. And very quickly, Taiwan uh, rebutted this uh, and state that it is absolutely unacceptable uh, for Taiwan, this, this uh, one country, two system policy. And this OCTS, uh, formulation is so unpalatable in Taiwan that the KMT also came out and say that the one country, two systems policy was never part of the 1992 consensus. I think another interesting development in 2009 uh, is that Tsai in her National Day speech, she debuted the term Republic of China, Taiwan, uh, with parentheses. In that speech, she emphasized that the Taiwan people shared memories over the past 17 years, um, since 1949. And during this 70 year period, um, the Taiwan experience is vastly different from that of mainland China. And this new term, Republic of China, Taiwan, I think is a step forward compared to Li Denghui's the Republic of China on Taiwan. I think what Tsai was trying to say was that the ROC is Taiwan and Taiwan is the ROC. And people in Taiwan here are bound by their shared memories over the past 70 years. And these memories are very distinctive from those people on mainland China. If we look at the public surveys, I think it shows uh, similar trends. Uh, the public opinion in Taiwan is largely averse to any one China idea that implies Taiwan is part of 
the PRC. Um, just give you a few examples, more than 80% of Taiwanese do not accept the 1992 consensus being defined as one China without acknowledging uh, the existence of the Republic of China. And also just to show you how confusing the 1992 consensus is to most of Taiwanese, as many as 44% of Taiwanese think that the consensus refers to the two sides of the strait being two separate countries. Let's look at this uh, long-standing survey conducted by uh, the National Zhengji University Selection Study Center. We know that the center has been conducted such surveys since 1994 about uh, people's political attitudes towards unification or independence. And here you can see um, that, so let me move this. I don't know if you guys can see, but here we see a spike um, from 2018 to 2020 uh, in the position, Li, maintain status quo, move towards independence. So this is sort of in the middle position um, of maintaining the status quo, but with an inclination of moving towards independence. And I should also say that uh, these surveys uh, are conducted with Taiwanese who, of course, understand what uh, Taiwan's declaration of independence would mean uh, in the reality, in, in the real world. Um, which is uh, a possible war uh, launched by uh, Beijing. So uh, the status quo have always occupied the majority of uh, uh, people, the majority of Taiwanese have always um, stay with the status quo option. But from 2018, this is a very uh, interesting change the position maintain status quo and move forward towards independence jumped from 15% to 25%. And that is a big jump. And let's also look at the, an, another, the other survey that uh, a National Gender University uh, Election Center conducted. Uh, similar trends. If you look at Taiwan, the I position uh, of identifying with exclusively Taiwanese. Um, it also jumped. And by way of background, um, I should say that uh, these four, uh, there are four options in this survey. The first is exclusively Taiwanese. Uh, do, you, are, do you identify yourself as being exclusively uh, Taiwanese. And the second option is both Taiwanese and Chinese. Third is Chinese. And uh, the fourth is no response. And we can see that the first option exclusively being Taiwanese jumped from 54% uh, to 64-63% uh, in two years. So that is very, if you look at this chart, that is an unusual spike. And what happened during um, this period? Uh, of course, we know that what happened is that the human rights crisis in Hong Kong happened. Um, the one country, two systems policy uh, fell apart in Hong Kong, uh, especially in 2020 when uh, Beijing passed the national security law for Hong Kong. Um, and I also said that um, in 2019 speech uh, that was, she brought up one country, two systems during that time. And that was really a bad time to bring up this policy when Hong Kongers were staging protests every day on the, on, on the streets. Um, so if we um, look at, uh, this all these trends combined together, we would think that, especially um, with the previous two charts, 
uh, we would think that yeah, there is indeed an an a consensus that is emerging in Taiwan, uh, but domestic politics are always very brutal, and the KMT and the DPP uh, they don't like each other a lot, and they act but. On the other hand, I think they do have more in common than they're willing to admit. They both share the view that the Republic of China is a democratic sovereign state, and they both reject one country, two systems. I also want to uh, quote here an article uh, by my colleagues at Academia Sinica, uh, Su Yantu professor and uh, Jianji professor. Their article, I think, is really brilliant uh, in pointing out that if there is anything that comes close to a fundamental constitutional consensus in Taiwan, it is the unwritten Uber constitutional norms with respect to so popular sovereignty and the fundamental constitutional order of liberal democracy. And I think a lot of people in Taiwan would take this a step further and say this consensus is multifaceted. It's not only just a, con uh, a constitutional consensus, it's also a political consensus in that Taiwan is already an independent sovereign state under the name of the ROC in which Taiwanese can enjoy the democratic way of life without interference from the outside. So I guess, you have seen the news uh, about the new uh, KMT chairperson, Eric Chu, and uh, he was elected three days ago, and his position uh, is that on the basis of the 1992 consensus and opposition to Taiwan independence, uh, the KMT and the CCP will move in the direction of seeking common ground while respecting differences. And this is very interesting. Uh, a, because he's still sticking with the 1992 consensus, although uh, the consensus is really not popular in Taiwan if associated with any one China notion. Second, he used a different word in the buzz term. Uh, uh, previously, I mentioned Chou Tong Chun Yi, um, seeking common ground while setting aside differences. Here, he uses Chou Tong Chun Yi, uh, seeking common ground while respecting differences. And I think um, this is sending a signal to Beijing that the genuine spirit behind the 1992 consensus was really uh, this respect for each other's interpretation, which was why the KMT and the CCP could work together during the 2008 and 2016 period. But I think the KMT is going to find it more difficult these days to sell any one China notions to Taiwanese voters as Xi Jinping um, increasingly pressures Taiwan uh, on multiple fronts, including military and diplomatic matters. Um, and I don't think the Taiwan-China cooperation seems unlikely, unless, unless Beijing is willing to relax its one China principle uh, and set aside one country, two systems, and also accept the ambiguity of whatever formula the two sides of the strait can agree on. But that's a big unless. I'll stop here. I've used my time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And now, um, as you know, before we, uh, before UJ began a presentation, we were having some problem with the um, connection from Jerry Cohen's home. So he is with us now um, by telephone and let's see whether this connection works. Jerry, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't start my video. That's fine. If you would just proceed, I will. I will see if I can turn on your video. But meanwhile, you the floor is yours to uh, to make your comments and responses to uh, to UGS presentation. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, heard 
a very learned, thoughtful presentation by Yu Jia Chun. And to some people, it may just seem a lot of hopeless lawyers quibbling over words. But it isn't. Uh, what's at stake is the future of Taiwan. And the President Tsai government in Taiwan, which refused to endorse the so-called understanding, the consensus about one China, really cannot give away the future. President Tsai has made it very clear that she does not want to change the status quo. She's not trying to create a international crisis. But she cannot adopt a formula that would implicitly declare that Taiwan in the future cannot be recognized as separate from China. Now, there are three issues really at stake here. Uh, one is, what is the legal status of Taiwan in the post-World War II system? And that's where the debate really comes in. The second question is, since Beijing does not agree with the view of the legal status of Taiwan at this point, uh, other members of the community, including the government on Taiwan, what can Beijing do about it? And as you Jeff pointed out, the anti-secession law purports to confirm the so-called right of Beijing under international law to use force if peaceful resolution of the dispute cannot be achieved. That's the second question. In today's world, is there a right on the part of one government to use force to settle a territorial dispute, a so-called irredentist dispute, where there is a dispute between uh, two governments over the proper ownership and control of territory? And Beijing says the US in the 1860s, resorted to force to suppress secession from the Southern government. Well, 1860s is a long time ago. And public international law has developed even in the 70 years that this problem uh, has been fulminating. We should note that this coming month, it will be 50 years since the Junkai dictatorship government of Taiwan was ousted from the UN as the legitimate representative of China and replaced by the People's Republic in Beijing. In February of the coming year, it will be 50 years since the first United States attempt to discuss with China the fate of Taiwan in the Shanghai communique, whose ambiguities people are still struggling to plumb. Because it was there that the United States seemed to hint that it would not dispute that Taiwan was Chinese territory. Despite the history of this question that the United States had developed uh, in the year 1950. In the beginning, the, the United States refused to defend Taiwan because although the peace treaties had not yet been concluded, uh, President Truman and Secretary Atchison regarded Taiwan as Chinese territory and we wouldn't interfere in the Civil War. And yet, less than six months later, when North Korea invaded South Korea, President Truman and Secretary Atchison announced that since Taiwan's legal status had not been formally 
acknowledged yet after World War II, uh, the United States would defend Taiwan. And we have been defending Taiwan ever since because there's been no resolution. The peace treaties did not confirm that Japan returned Taiwan to China. But Chiang Kai-shek's forces controlled Taiwan October 25th of 1945, and although that was never formalized internationally, uh, the government of the Republic of China, Chiang Kai-shek's government, the heir to which is on Taiwan today, did govern Taiwan for a few years uh, and continued to govern even after the communist takeover of the mainland in 1949. So you see, this is the formula for a perfect storm. Beijing remembers well the statements of January 1950. Beijing remembers the US reversal. And so Beijing has been nurturing for over 70 years a claim to Taiwan that they fear manipulation by the foreign powers has denied them. On the other hand, this isn't the Taiwan of 1945. This isn't Chiang Kai-shek's Taiwan of 1975. Nothing stands still for long. Taiwan has become an admirable democratic polity and the wishes of its people cannot be ignored. And the Taiwan people have their own identity. They do not want to become part of this increasingly repressive dictatorship on the mainland. And that's what's at stake in this war of words. And what we have to see is how do we solve this problem? Uh, there can't be a decent transfer of Taiwan to the mainland unless that's what the people of Taiwan vote for. Beijing never wants people of Chinese ethnicity to vote they say it's not necessary because they all know they're Chinese. Well, that's nonsense. We wouldn't say that in the United States, uh, that because our uh, revolution was against England, uh, that the people of uh, America are essentially English and are longing to be reincorporated in the United Kingdom. So we have to see how to solve this problem. Uh, if there is no longer to use force to settle these disputes, because I think the world has changed in that respect in recent decades. How should the problem be settled? And here we have options. The international law has institutions, the world court, international arbitration arrangements can be made. You have uh, opportunities for uh, even uh, mediation of disputes with third party assistance. Negotiations, of course, have failed on this question. Beijing said this isn't an international question. This isn't open to the purely domestic Chinese question. Well, in those circumstances, what can be done? I think the best that can be done at this point is to support Taiwan's democratic achievement, but to do so in a way that will not inflame further the relationship. And yet at the same time, recognize the world isn't standing still. Taiwan is an increasingly important player in the world community. It's engaging every day in functional, positive, cooperative interactions with many of the players of the world, even in the absence of formal diplomatic relations. And there's a need to develop further institutions to deal with this unique situation. A new form of international relations is gradually developing. That's why there's another struggle over names going on. What should the office of a foreign government in Taiwan that doesn't recognize formally Taiwan be called, we call it the American Institute in Taiwan. Doesn't sound like an embassy, 
but it has the functions of an embassy. Japan has recently changed the name of its comparable institution in order better to reflect the interactions. And there's a struggle over what other countries uh, should use for a name in Taiwan. And even more probably, what name should Taiwan use in its representative offices in countries where it no longer has diplomatic relations? It only has diplomatic relations with 15 uh, mostly smaller countries now but it has very important functional relations, economic, political, social, athletic, et cetera, cultural, with all the big players of the world. And should the office of Taiwan be called the Taipei office, because Taipei is the capital of Taiwan? Should it be called the Taiwan representative office? That would be more realistic. Should it be called as in the United States, uh, the Taipei uh, Technical and Economic uh, Organization, so-called TEPRO. Uh, there's a struggle to make names accord with functions and to recognize that Taiwan, although not formally recognized by most countries, is a very active, important, deserving player. And how can we do that without creating a further graver damage to the world community and the threat of war, whether war is inflicted by either side intentionally or perhaps accidentally. And what kind of war would it be? Would it be limited war? Would it be nuclear war? Do we want to defend Taiwan by seeing its destruction? Uh, do we want to deal with the mainland by destroying tens of nuclear attacks on mainland. And what would a nuclear attack on the United States yield? This is a horrendous thought. That's why this is the most important problem of an immediate nature in international relations, far more important than the South China Sea. Of, we can't settle the question of Hong Kong being taken over by the tyranny of Beijing. We can't do more than complain much about the horrors inflicted on the people, Xinjiang on the repression of human rights lawyers and their advocates and clients uh, in the mainland. But Taiwan is a problem of huge importance that can lead to horrible consequences. So we have to deal with it very delicately. And words matter. That's why we've heard this learned exegesis by Yuja on the struggle over words, because words are symbols by which human act. And Beijing is alert as any uh, party in the world to the significance of words. So this is the background. And we have to think, how do we steer through this course between Scylla and Charybdis? And that's why we're having this program, and we look forward to uh, hearing your questions and comments. And maybe I've said enough so that uh, we should devote the remaining time to uh, discussion. I'd love to hear what Catherine thinks and our other colleagues at the U.S. Asia Law Institute, but there are also people uh, among our other participants who have much to say. Thank you, Jerry. Um, if you don't mind, Jerry, I'm going to continue to leave your camera off because I think that it is helping to address uh, your bandwidth problem. And so we heard you very well just now, although we unfortunately couldn't see you, but we did hear you. So if you don't mind, you will be heard but not seen. Um, and we'll take that as a, as a good solution to the technical dilemmas that we've faced this morning. Um, I'd like to, we do have some questions starting to come. I'm going to, I'm going to pull them in. Um, one issue I'd just like to put before both of you right now is what impact uh, you think uh, the recent U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan actually may have had on the delicate balance uh, between Beijing and Taiwan. As we know, Beijing uh, attempted to turn this to its advantage uh, as a, uh, a propaganda 
uh, opportunity to say uh, to the people of Taiwan, uh, the United States withdraws when, you know, when things get uh, tough, uh, it doesn't have staying power, uh, it's not going to keep its troops on the other side of the globe forever, uh, you too will be abandoned ultimately. Did that um, land, did that propaganda message find any kind of um, reception in Taiwan? Uh, how was the Afghanistan um, uh, fall to uh, the Taliban received in Taiwan? Did, uh, Yujia and Jerry both, I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts about that. And you're you, muted. Yeah, why don't you tell us about Taiwan? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think the uh, propaganda by Beijing is really, as uh, Catherine has described, to say that uh, the US cannot be trusted. So Taiwan uh, uh, has better work with um, China and cooperate with China and accept the uh, one China framework, et cetera. But it doesn't really have a uh, any kind of appeal in Taiwan, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, after uh, the propaganda, we've also seen different articles coming out uh, re refuting this uh, analogy. Uh, and I think they are correct in pointing out uh, Taiwan is not Afghanistan. And uh, this has also been uh, widely um, uh, understood in, in Taiwan that uh, the situations uh, between, you know, the two situations are vastly different. And so I don't see that propaganda working in Taiwan. Um, but I also want to say that um, Taiwanese know that uh, we have to defend ourselves uh, in order for uh, other countries to uh, lend a hand when necessary. Um, so it's it's not that Taiwanese, uh, you know, think about only relying on uh, the U.S. or uh, other allies' uh, military support uh, when. A, a confrontation happens, but uh, we, we're also struggling to um, compete with China uh, with regard to military power. So uh, the solution, uh, you know, among, you know, thought about among military experts is asymmetry uh, warfare. And I'm not a military expert, so I'm not gonna go into this, but I just wanna emphasize that um, Taiwanese know that we have to do more to ready ourselves. And there are some young politicians that are uh, pushing Taiwan towards this direction. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we also um, have very limited resources. Could you um, maybe talk a little bit um, about what, how this um, crisis or tense relations, maybe I should avoid the crisis word since it's ongoing, how it is being perceived in Taiwan by ordinary people going about their daily lives. Is there any sense of crisis? How much awareness, discussion on a daily basis, or is it possible to go through one's uh, day without actually um, thinking about this, uh, you know, going to your work, picking up your children from school and so on without actually focusing on this. To what extent is there a sense of crisis um, and is it dinner table conversation or not? So, um, you know, it's really hard uh, to live your daily life if you're constantly thinking about the threat of war um, and the destruction of your homeland. So I think most of people uh, do not often uh, talk about uh, this uh, possibility, uh, but of course we are aware of this possibility, but we have to go on our lives. And so I think when I talk to my friends and uh, you know, we all acknowledged that uh, if we uh, declare de jure independence, uh, 
it's going to pro provoke some kind of reaction from Beijing. Uh, so, and that is shown on the poll. You can see that people don't rush to, you know, go declare independence. They uh, basically really uh, conservatively stay in the category of maintaining the status quo. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's, it's um, I have to say a lot of people in Taiwan had their heart broken when they saw Hong Kong mm -hmm. fell apart last year. Uh, and of course we, and that's why there's this reaction in Taiwan to say that we Taiwanese as a democracy should support Hong Kong. Uh, and so to answer your question, yes, uh, it's always in the background, but it's not always out there, but it will always be an issue when the election comes. And you will see that again uh, in 2024. Right. You know, when, when Eric Chu says that he uh, is maintaining the standard KMT position, that there is a 19, that there in fact is a 1992 consensus and that Taiwan should stand by this 1992 consensus, what, what, what impact would it actually have on any specific policy if he were to be president tomorrow or next month? Would that, what concrete consequences would you see following from his uh, adherence to the 1992 consensus? Is it, is it simply words, or which of course, as Jerry just pointed out, matter a great deal, but is there some specific action that would then follow from that? So I think uh, that's a big if. So if Julie, when uh, Eric Chu uh, is to be elected as president, that's really a big if, but if he is elected as president, I uh, think he will uh, try to resume cooperation with China, of course. And, uh, but unlike his uh, uh, predecessor, Ma ying I think he's gonna find it a much more difficult job to do. Uh, because of the reasons that I've stated, um, I think Xi Jinping's push uh, is very different from Hu Jintao's uh, policy on Taiwan. Uh, so, you know, uh, now we're dealing with a very different Chinese leader um, mm -hmm. who has said that, you know, the Chinese dream is for the national uh, rejuvenation and unification. Um, and I think on the uh, second point is, my second point is that the low hanging fruits have already, you know, been uh, taken uh, in the first period of cooperation uh, of the first, the only recent cooperation period, uh, 2008 to 2016. That's when uh, the both sides proxy organizations signed 23 cross-strait agreements ranging from tourism to um, mutual judicial assistance. So the next step is going to be really difficult for the KMT and uh, the CCP to come up with the, the next level of cooperation, which is to say more integration um, in economics, as well as maybe political uh, affairs. And that's a tough sell for Taiwanese voters. So I really think it's going to be limited if, if there's co uh, any cooperation. Right. So what would a specific um, economic integration measure uh, be that might be taken that hasn't yet been taken? In other words, have have businesses, for example, Taiwan businesses, do they have a, a list in their pocket of, you know, the top three moves toward economic integration that haven't yet occurred that they think would make their, um, their business outlooks better or would facilitate their cross-straits um, uh, investment and so on? 
are there specific moves that are on a, on a list that we could anticipate if the KMT came to power? That's what would they would focus on for action. Because as you said, the you know we have flights, we have postage, we have you know uh, tourism, etc. You know all of the obvious things are there. Is there something less obvious that perhaps uh, those of us not in business are not perceiving that is that there is a need that there is a gap? There are still many gaps, um, and uh, the two sides signed um, a, a framework agreement on economic cooperation uh, 2012, if I remember correctly. And then they, uh, the KMT in Taiwan tried to push under this framework, try to push the legislature to pass uh, uh, the, the agreement on um, services uh, trade. And that got you know, you know, really pushed back from this, the younger generations as well as Taiwanese society, which then, then led to um, the sunflower movement in 2014, which changed everything. Mm -hmm. So that agreement about services trade was not really passed because uh, a lot of students stormed into the legislature and occupied the chamber for 24 days. And there were um, 500,000 uh, uh, people on the streets supporting the students. So since then, cross-strait cooperation really cooled off and that's why I said that I don't see a lot of cooperation uh, without strict scrutiny on Taiwan's side uh, through a democratic process. The self-flower movement really originated from the Taiwan society's aversion to the KMT's um, cooperation with China without a proper democratic oversight process. And so how are you going to do that in the future uh, when we have a process in place? We haven't had any, by the way. And once we have this process, every agreement, like any democratic country, is going to be reviewed by our legislature. So I think uh, that is also difficult. Right. So, Jerry, I think we have you back with us. So, Jose Alvarez has a question in the queue um, that is about international law and how international law views the situation. Um, I would like to give the mic to uh, Jose to ask, ask you that question uh, himself, and I've um, unmuted him. So, Jose, if you would go ahead and raise your question, and then Jerry can respond. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so, uh, so Jerry, um, uh, there was a mention of the 2009 article. And so I think um, one of my questions is what has really changed since that article in terms of international law? Uh, we know that uh, the current regime in Beijing has hardened its position by, for example, opposing Taiwan's continued observer status in a, an organization like the World Health Organization. So in terms of its view, it has hardened its position on behalf of the One China policy. But as you indicate, uh, time doesn't stand still. And 70 years is a long time uh, for existence of Taiwan. And I'm wondering um, what you think might be the outcome if uh, these questions were presented to a neutral judge on the ICJ. So I'm thinking, uh, you may not be aware of it, but our own Jeremy Waldron, and he was writing very controversially about Israel's occupation of the West Bank. Um, he suggested that international law should recognize what he calls supersession, where an initial injustice is overtaken by later events. And I, in the, in the q and I indicated the website for that short piece. And so maybe someone, say Japan, could take the position that uh, given 70 years, uh, we should now accept the distinct existence of both Taiwan and the PRC, even if we were to say that originally the breakaway republic was illegal. 
Now, one way this could come up in a tangible way is, as you know, Taiwan and uh, uh, the People's Republic are both having competing bids to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And so I, my question is, just to put it very concretely, do you think it would be legal under international law uh, for Japan to accept Taiwan as a state party to the TPP, or would that still be considered an illegal intervention in the, uh, in the Beijing's sovereignty? Um, what would a, a neutral judge say about that under international law? So many aspects to that good question, Jose. One is, as I said earlier, Beijing says this is not an international question. Therefore, it's not willing to send any of these issues to an international tribunal, uh, whether it's the ICJ or whether it's some arbitration tribunal, they won't even accept mediation. They refuse to recognize that this is a critical, the critical international question. And that is an attitude that has to be overcome. And at the same time, Beijing is arguing that it accepts the international law system and indeed is trying and seeming to make some progress in controlling international institutions. And we've seen the progress they've made in controlling the UN and influencing the uh, WHO and in taking other steps. Now, as to this CPTPP business, of course, Taipei can be admitted as Taiwan uh, and uh, on an economic and sociological basis, not as a formal state, uh, just as it was admitted uh, even by Beijing to the WTO. But you're raising a question whether Japan can recognize Taiwan as a state party. Uh, and of course, that's precisely what uh, the uh, Chinese have always rejected. Uh, if the question could, be, could come before an international tribunal, I think a persuasive argument can be made that the uh, Taiwan position is one worthy of recognition that the failure of the post-war uh, legal arrangements after World War II uh, to formalize the question leaves open the whole problem uh, for future solution because of the developments that international law recognizes, including the right of peoples to determine uh, their own fate. Beijing never wants to see people vote. Uh, Hong Kong should have been given the right to vote about its future as other uh, post-colonial uh, territories were given, but Beijing got it removed from the UN uh, agenda for such purposes. And we see what the consequences are, as Yuja has just reminded us. So uh, it's the unwillingness to find some modus vivendi or to find some way of talking about resolution of the problem on Beijing's part, because it's totally committed to the situation as it found it uh, in 1949-50. And as it thought it was moving toward acquiescence of the US in, uh, in the Shanghai communique. But events have got out of the hands of Beijing. And we have to steer, as I said, a careful course on the one hand, making sure that Beijing does not, through one method or another, make the people of Taiwan succumb unwillingly. On the other hand, we have to avoid saving people on Taiwan by destroying them and perhaps destroying us and people in mainland China. Uh, through a nuclear war. This is quite a challenge. Uh, I got interrupted by telecommunications when I was trying to respond to Catherine's good question uh, about 
of the implications of withdrawal from Afghanistan. On the one hand, the articulated rationale is to free our resources better to bolster our position than that of Taiwan uh, in Asia. On the other hand, people say it demonstrates the unwillingness of the American people to go to war in a far off area where we are ill positioned by geography uh, to uh, win. And this is being argued by many uh, in the younger generation in America too. And the US has to make clear that it not only takes international actions to demonstrate further support for Taiwan, but also to lead American public opinion so they understand what's at stake here. And they understand, as Yuji pointed out, that Taiwan is not Afghanistan. And our stake in Asia is much greater than our stake in the Middle East. And we shouldn't neglect the fact that Taiwan is regarded as a very important strategic resource for the defense of other countries in the region. Japan is increasingly coming to express public awareness of this. South Korea certainly is, and the Southeast Asian nations are also. So a lot is at stake here. There's a great deal of uncertainty, but I think we have to do everything possible to emulate what we did during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. On the one hand, you have to arm and be strong in every way. On the other hand, not provoke the kind of war that everybody fears. And that's not an easy task for any president or government or international alliance, but that's what we've got to do and wait because this won't last forever. The Xi Jinping regime will not last forever. Change is occurring in China, which is undergoing many profound uh, strains at the moment. There will be a change and we have to wait it out. We have to stay safe and we have to do our best to bolster the encouraging developments in Taiwan. But as you just says, the Taiwan people have to show they are different from Afghanistan and they are aware of and willing uh, to support their own cause. So, so I just want to respond to Professor Alvarez's very good question as well. Um, if you we if we look at just look at the law and uh, look at the requirements of statehood, um, and Taiwan meets all the four uh, requirements of this uh, of statehood, population, uh, territory, government, and the ability to enter relations with other states. Um, However, uh, there have been uh, scholars in international law arguing that um, Taiwan is not a state because it still has not unequivocally asserted its separation from China and is not recognized as a state distinct, uh, distinct from China. And that includes uh, James Crawford. Um, and I think it's, it's very easy and convenient to ignore the fact that uh, what would happen to Taiwan if Taiwan does uh, assert itself, uh, its separation from China unequivocally? And we all know that uh, what's going to happen. So I think it's uh, unrealistic and, and unpractical uh, to think that Taiwan has to make some sort of uh, announcement uh, to the international world that it's separate from China. Um, and I don't think this is a, ve uh, a reasonable way, approach uh, to think about Taiwan's sovereignty when you have, when you've been under, when Taiwan has been under the threat of war. Thank you. Um, I wanted to bring in one of the, another one of the questions uh, in the queue from uh, Julian Ku asking uh, about the uh, KMT's uh, position getting less and less support in the polls in Taiwan. He asks, if the KMT falls apart as a political force, 
do you see a more aggressively pro-independence Taiwan emerging in the near future? And that Yujia or Jerry, either of you? Well, uh, Yujia can respond to this, of course. Uh, my own view is Eric Chu, although I think he's a NYU graduate at one point, and his new platform for leading the KMT is a prescription for political suicide domestically. And this question rightly focuses on, so what? What are the implications? Will that release uh, the pressures that have so far restrained the very ardent DPP pro-independence forces? My feeling is the people on Taiwan have also demonstrated not only a hostility to a takeover by Beijing, but also uh, an unwillingness to take on Beijing by a needless provocation. And I think that with the able management of President Tsai, that these forces uh, can be uh, restrained. Uh, there are some super patriots uh, in the uh, DPP, but uh, I think they're reckless and they may overestimate the support of the United States uh, and other governments. Uh, if uh, they provoke uh, Beijing needlessly, so as quo, mm -hmm. uh, even though Beijing is unhappy, and even though the ardent pro-independence people are unhappy with it. Yuja, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, yes, I would just add that uh, if uh, I don't have the chart here, but if you recall the charts that I showed in my presentation, uh, the uh, identifying uh, with being exclusively Chi uh, Taiwanese um, is increasing every year. And so I would say this is a very uh, steady uh, development. And um, I, I think that um, with, younger generation is especially um, with younger generation, unification with mainland China is a lost cause. Uh, they, they don't associate with the cause. Um, the older generations, some of them, especially from the KMT, may still have this um, ideal um, associated with mainland China but it's overall a lost cause in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Jerry, one of the, um, the most common questions I'm seeing people asking is, uh, is your favorite question, what is to be done? You know, um, and it, it's not quite clear to me whether what, from what you just said, you are advocating an, an active policy on the part of the United States uh, and its allies somehow on, on behalf of Taiwan's interests or uh, on behalf of maintaining peace or whether you're advocating a, a sort of watchful policy. You did mention um, uh, uh, getting the issue before an international tribunal. And I'm wondering, are you advocating that that should happen? And if so, how could that happen? Who would need to take action? How could the matter be put to a tribunal? Would that have any positive effect? Because we could assume, of course, Beijing would not participate. Uh, you know, that raises the interesting question of, is there utility in these unaf uh, tribunal that considers, for example, Beijing's atrocities in Xinjiang? Mm -hmm. uh, I was asked some time ago to take part in London in an international tribunal to confirm the atrocities committed against Falun Gong people uh, in the mainland. I was unable to do it for other reasons, but I thought I hesitated. And yet I like the idea of demonstration tribunals that would do a serious job of articulating the question. 
but there are books that are doing this. If you look at uh, Professor Frank Zhang's book on the legal status of Taiwan, uh, he's a Fordham Law professor originally from Taiwan, a very smart lawyer. Uh, he's done a very good job of giving you the background of the issue and also of uh, articulating the reasons why uh, today uh, Taiwan uh, should not be regarded as part of Chinese territory. So I think we have to be patient. As I said earlier, uh, we have to build through our own forces and through alliances with uh, all the countries around China that are uneasy about the PRC, and to say the least, some of them more overtly about it, some discreetly. And we have to see that Taiwan does its part in making its democracy ever expanding. There are still steps Taiwan can be taking to improve the human rights situation on Taiwan. And we have to be careful. We don't unnecessarily cross a reasonable red line on the part of Beijing. And we just have to wait. Some questions simply require waiting. Uh, as you say, Catherine, I don't see a realistic possibility that Beijing will take part in any negotiation, mediation, arbitration, adjudication uh, on these questions. Beijing fears impartial, up-to-date interpretations of international law by relevant experts, even while asserting its leadership is increasing in the world community. Mm -hmm. There seems to be um, an urgent need to educate publics then, uh, educate the public in Taiwan about what their realistic options are, educate the public in the United States and in other uh, allied countries about why Taiwan should matter. So uh, we were talking before about messages following Afghanistan and whether um, the public would be supportive of the United States going to Taiwan's assistance were there to be any kind of a conflict. What would the, we only have a minute left, so this will have to be very brief, but what should the US government message be to the American public about why Taiwan matters to you? Why should the United States be risking uh, blood and treasure for Taiwan? What is that very brief soundbite that, that people should hear? We need a presidential speech by President Biden who's increasingly under pressure to make many presidential speeches. But this one, in the context of anxiety over our relations with China, would be a great occasion for demonstrating all the accomplishments of the people on Taiwan and its strategic as well as its political importance and the willingness of the United States to discuss all these questions uh, with China, Taiwan, and other relevant players. Uh, we simply have to uh, take steps. Chairman Mao said, walk on two legs, and we have to walk on two legs of support and yet not give up engagement or negotiation. And the last week has shown some willingness on the part of the US and China to recognize that we have to start getting rid of some of the serious problems and get down to long-term uh, negotiations as responsible players, not players that will threaten the world with some military calamity. Last word from you, Yuja. Yes, I would say that of course there are many geographical and strategic uh, reasons for the U.S. to defend Taiwan, and it's in the U.S. interest to defend Taiwan, but I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about Taiwan as a democracy, and Taiwan has 
transform itself um, on its own as well as under international pressure from an authoritarian regime to today's vibrant democracy. And that is why in my slides, the first one I put uh, the uh, photo of uh, the parade of gays and lesbians in, in Taipei uh, in two, 2018. Um, and then a year later, uh, we, we also legalized the same sex marriage. So I think we share a lot of values um, with today's democracies. And I want to say that uh, for this, Taiwan is worth defending. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yu Jie Chen and uh, Jerry Cohen for a very stimulating discussion as we anticipated. And thanks to the audience for your terrific questions and, and input. We'll look forward to seeing you all again in a week uh, at our next uh, webinar. Bye-bye.